This video is about taking derivatives and integrals of vector-valued functions. In Calculus 1, we took the derivatives of real-valued functions, y equals f of x, and we found that f prime of x evaluated at an x value a gave us the slope of the tangent line at x equals a. We first evaluated derivatives by a limiting process, taking the slopes of secant lines in between a and a point close to a. In other words, algebraically, we define the derivative as the limit as h goes to 0 of f of a plus h minus f of a over h, where this ratio represented the slope of the secant line between the points a f of a and a plus h f of a plus h. So how could we generalize this process to curves defined in two or three or even more dimensions by vector-valued functions? More specifically, suppose a particle is moving according to the vector equation r of t. How can we find a tangent vector that gives the direction and speed that the particle is traveling? For simplicity, I'm going to draw a diagram in two dimensions, even though this process will work for three or even more dimensions. Let me fix a t value, t equals a, which will correspond, for example, to maybe this point right here. So now if I draw a vector whose initial point is at the origin, the tip of this vector is the vector r of a. Now I want to find the tangent vector at t equals a, which is going to be a vector pointing in maybe approximately this direction, assuming that the curve is being traversed in this direction as t increases. To find that tangent vector, I can use the same techniques that we used in Calculus 1. That is, I can look at a nearby point, r of a plus h, for some small number h. Here's the vector r of a plus h. And now I can look at the secant vector that goes in between r of a and r of a plus h. Notice that by vector arithmetic, the vector r of a plus the secant vector equals the vector r of a plus h. So therefore, the secant vector is equal to r of a plus h minus r of a. Now I could keep taking secant vectors in between closer and closer points. And in a limit, that would give me a vector that pointed in the right direction, but it would shrink down to 0 in size. Since I want my limiting vector to have the appropriate direction and length, instead of taking these direct secant vectors, I'm going to use rescaled secant vectors, whose length is always the average speed that the particle goes between these two points. To get that rescaled secant vector, I'll take the difference of my two position vectors and divide by the difference in time, which is h. This is very analogous to the Calc 1 calculation of derivatives, where we didn't just take the difference in y values on the numerator, which would have just gone to 0. We had to rescale it by taking a difference in x values also. Now to get the tangent vector, we just take the limit as h goes to 0 of these rescaled secant vectors. Now if we write our original r of t in components, then we can write out our limit in terms of components and rewrite a little bit. Now taking the limit of a vector is the same thing as taking the limit of each component separately, which just gives us our familiar calculus one derivatives for each component. Therefore, the tangent vector at x equals a can just be found by taking the derivatives of each component at x equals a separately. This holds for vectors with, in three or more dimensions as well as vectors in two dimensions. This quantity is called r prime of a and is also called the derivative of r of t at x equals a. To summarize, the derivative of the vector function r of t is the same thing as a tangent vector and is defined as the r dt or r prime of t as the limit as h goes to 0 of r of 
t plus h minus r of t over h. If r is given in components, this time I'm making it a three-dimensional vector function, then r prime of t can be computed by taking the derivatives, the ordinary calc 1 derivatives, of each component separately. The derivative of a vector function is a vector. Again, it's the same thing as the tangent vector. As with any vector, we can normalize the tangent vector to make it have length 1. That's called the unit tangent vector. It's denoted with a capital T, and we get it by taking r prime of t and dividing by the magnitude of r prime of t. The tangent line is going to be the line that goes through the point r of a in the direction of the tangent vector. If the vector function r of t is given in components as above, then the point r of a can be described in terms of those components at a, and the tangent vector r prime of a can also be described in terms of the derivatives of those components at a. So the line through this point with this direction can be given with parametric equations x equals f of a plus t f prime of a and y and z similarly. We can write the same thing more compactly if we want with a vector equation. I'll just call it w of t equals r of a plus t times r prime of a. This is exactly the same information. The components of w are just the x, y, and z coordinates of the line. Let's try an example with a vector function whose components are given by t squared, t cubed. To find r prime of 1, let's start by finding r prime of t. We do component-wise differentiation, so that's 2t, 3t squared. And so r prime of 1, we get by plugging in 1, and that's just 2, 3. We can plot the curve r of t by plotting a bunch of points. It's going to look something like this. You might also find it useful to convert it to Cartesian coordinates, since x is t squared and y equals t cubed. Solving for t and replacing, we get y equals x to the 3 halves. Now at t equals 1, that's a point with x and y coordinates 1, 1, we have a tangent vector that gets over by 2 and up by 3, so that's going to be approximately this one right here. Notice that this vector does seem to be heading in the direction of the curve at this point. To find the unit tangent vector, we just take r prime and divide by its magnitude. So that's the vector 2, 3 divided by the square root of 13. Finally, to find the equation of the tangent line, we use the fact that the line goes through the point 1, 1. And we can write the equation for that line parametrically as x equals 1 plus 2t, y equals 1 plus 3t, using the direction vector r prime of 1, which is 2, 3. So now we've done a little work with derivatives of vector functions. Let's move on to integrals of vector functions. We took the derivatives of vector-valued functions by taking the derivative of each component separately. We'll do the same thing for the integrals of vector functions. In other words, the integral of a function whose components are f, g, and h can be found by integrating separately f of t dt, g of t dt, and h of t dt. Definite integrals also work just like you'd expect. For example, let's compute the integral for 1 to 2 of this vector-valued function. We know that we can do this by computing the integral of each component separately. Now the integral from 1 to 2 of 1 over t dt is ln absolute value of t evaluated between 2 and 1. That's ln 2 minus ln 1, or just ln 2. For the second integral, the integral from 1 to 2 of e to the t dt, that's e to the t evaluated between 2 and 1, so that's e squared minus e. To compute the third integral, we can use integration by parts. 
let's say that u equal t, dv equal e to the t dt, then du is dt, and v is e to the t. By the integration by parts formula, we get u times v, so that's t e to the t, minus the integral of v du, that's e to the t dt. Everything's still evaluated between 1 and 2. Since the integral of e to the t is just e to the t, we can evaluate this whole thing as 2e squared minus e minus e squared minus e, which simplifies to e squared. Finally, we can put all this together to get our answer, which is just ln2 times i plus e squared minus e times j plus e squared times k. In this video, we saw that we could take the derivative of a vector valued function by taking the derivatives of each component separately. Similarly, the integral of a vector valued function is the vector we get by taking the integral of each component separately.